Hello, She Loves Community. I am Ida Leith McVicker, and I'm so excited to tell you about my new book that's coming out in April 2022. It's called Recovering Racists, Dismantling White Supremacy and Reclaiming Our Humanity. The book follows my journey of over 30 years and across three continents to shatter the lies that white supremacy had embedded deep within my soul. I hope to help white people realize that grappling with this legacy of white supremacy and recovering from our racism is lifelong work, and it requires both inner transformation and societal change. So if you long for healing, change, living into our common humanity, and for a different world, this book is for you. Learn more about the book at idelet.com. That's I-D-E-L-E-T-T-E.com. And get up to 40% off and free shipping at bakerbookhouse.com. I would love to be on this journey with you. This is Liberating Faith, a She Loves podcast. We are a chorus of voices creating space and weaving together the world we long for. A world that starts with love. This is for people who walk in a faith that remembers God is love. This is for people who want to live out a faith rooted and grounded in love. And as Maya Angelou reminds us, love liberates. Liberating Faith invites you into conversations, stories, and perspectives from around the globe. She Loves has always been about creating both safe and brave spaces on the internet, inviting a chorus of voices to create culture together. We embrace an anti-racist faith, a decolonizing faith, a feminist faith, an affirming faith, because we are liberated together here. May you feel rooted and grounded in love. May you be expanded in your listening. May something in you become a little more unbound. May something in you soften. May you find what you are looking for now. This is Liberating Faith. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Liberating Faith, a She Loves podcast. My name is Leah Abraham. I'm the editor-in-chief of She Loves Magazine, and I'm really excited that you're listening in to this special episode because it is in honor of Mother's Day. And to celebrate that day, I have invited my mom to the podcast to talk to her about motherhood and whatever else I am curious to learn about her. Um, Amma, welcome. Welcome to the show. How, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thanks for having me on your show. <laughs> Thanks for saying yes. Um, <laughs> do you want to introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about you? Sure. Uh, my name is uh, Debbie Abraham. I'm Leah and David's mom. And I'm happy to be here. Uh, happy to celebrate Mother's Day with you guys. Um, basically, uh, I, I grew up in India. And then as along with Leah, we moved to the US and now we have settled in Portland, Oregon. And I work in the architectural field and I enjoy what I do. And now I have a lot of time since Leah and David are on their own, married and settled. Uh, so thank you, uh, Leah, for having me on the show. Thanks for being here. Um, I wanted to start this episode asking you what it's like raising me. I, do I, I don't know if I want to hear that answer though. <laughs> sure. um, but I'm curious, just in general, what has motherhood been like for you? Um, it's been what, 30 some years now? Yes, 30 some years. And it's been a pleasure. It's been uh, a wonderful experience, especially uh, I'm proud to say that both of you, David and Leah, both of you have been wonderful kids. You've not given us much trouble other than the occasional uh, you know, issues that, that we all, all know. It's all funny stuff, uh, enjoyable stuff, and things that we can look back and laugh at and uh, talk about. But other than that, it's been a wonderful experience. 
Yeah, what's I know. Been, what's been wonderful about it specifically? Well, I do know that, you know, one thing is we raised you along with grandparents. So I had the opportunity of, uh, um, you know, having a lot of support and help and guidance from your grandparents, first of all. And then, which being in a joint family, we also had a lot of, uh, uh, you know, advice and uh, maybe, uh, what do you say? Advice and support and, uh, you know, from grandparents' side, mm -hmm. point of view. So that said, uh, I also had uh, a lot of time, I guess, uh, raising new kids because I didn't have to be involved in a lot of housework when we were back in India. We had a lot of help in that, uh, in the kitchen and in the house. So I think I had a lot of time with you guys. I was able to take you to school, all the school activities and things like that. Mm -hmm. That said, I was also a full-time, uh, you know, I was working full-time, but in spite of that, compared to some other uh, mm -hmm. folks that I know, I think I had more time uh, in that respect. So I enjoyed, uh, you know, all those moments and uh, uh, I can look back and say, hey, you know, I didn't have fun raising new kids. Yeah. Oh, that's, I'm surprised by that answer, actually. <laughs> um, do you remember what it was like when you were pregnant with my older brother? Um, do you remember what, do you remember feeling scared to be a mother or excited? Do you remember any of that time? Uh, I do, of course. Every mother remembers all those, especially the first first baby when you're expecting your first baby. You don't know anything about pregnancy and things like that as much as you knew earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a experience by itself. So you're learning a lot, you're anticipating, especially, uh, you know, we did not know whether we were getting a girl or a boy. So that's another added uh, uh anxiety or not anxiety but uh, something that we looked forward to um, and then preparation preparing for your first baby was also uh, sort of exciting you know we started buying furniture little clothing uh, and things like that getting ready for you guys to come whoever it was so um yeah little bit of toys you know uh, we, I still have some of the toys that I bought before you guys were born so oh. that was interesting yeah <laughs> um what have you learned about motherhood from your mother um just for a little bit of context my grandmother has passed away 23 years now yes yeah um then you had a very special relationship with her that's so true um, one thing is, I do recall when I look back at my childhood and when she raised me, she was, of course, a little bit strict come, because she was a teacher. But at the same time, she was extremely friendly and she was like a friend to us. I can remember weekends when she would actually, you know, we, we would have our lunch qu very quickly. And then soon after lunch, we would, my brother, myself and my mom would read comics in the afternoon munching on little peanut candies so that was really special and then she would take us for all the Indian uh, English children's movies that were released uh, so she used to take us for um, any kind of exhibitions and things like that but it was fun growing up with her and one thing I learned from her was not to stress out a lot a little, as much as I do now you know I always stress out over parenting but mm -hmm. she was one who was like very cool about it I think my dad stressed out more than she did but I think that, you've learned a lot about incorporating fun into raising kids from her I think I think so too yeah, yeah. you probably know how I helped you with craft projects and drawing Okay, let's like talk about you helping me with craft projects for first. <laughs> um, I'm, my mom is very artistic. She's very talented. And I was an extremely lazy student, I felt like. And I learned very early on that like my mom really liked to do my artistic related creative projects. And so I would suddenly be like, 
Emma, can you help me on this one little thing about this project? And my mom's control freakness would take over and she'd end up doing the entire thing for me and I'd get an amazing grade for it. You remember that? I do, I do, I do. <laughs> I, on that note, I also remember helping my mom with her school posters and little artwork. Mm -hmm. So I helped her with that and I'm proud to say that I helped you as well. Oh. <laughs> Um, I am curious to know a little bit about um, how we ended up as immigrants. Um, you got married and then moved to the U.S. because my dad and all of my uh, dad's family was already in the U.S. Um, and my brother and I were born in the U.S. And when I was three years old, you and Acha made the decision to move back to India. Can you tell me a little bit about that and why you made that decision? Yes, of course. Uh, so um, when we got married, we had this idea that we would go back to India and raise our kids in India so that you guys are exposed to the Indian culture, learn the language, learn what the culture is about and all those things. So it came to a point after you guys were, when you were three, it came to a point when uh, uh, Acha's dad, my my father-in-law was retired and he chose to go back and retire in India. And we thought it was a great time for us to move with them along with you and settle in India, and get you, you, both of you enrolled in a school, local school in India so that you can learn the Indian language and, and get to know your culture a little bit more. So that's how we ended up being in, in India. But at the same time, when uh, David um, grew up and soon after high school, he liked to go in for music. He wanted to do music as a man. So, and there were a lot of opportunities here in India, uh, in the US. And so when Acha had come here temporarily to work for a few years, we decided, hey, maybe it's a good time for all of us to move so that you all get a good education. And that's how we ended up back in Portland. But we found that Portland is such a great place to be in, raise our kids. It gives you good values, good education. You know, you had good, great friends. Uh, that's how we moved back to Portland. What was the transition for you? Because you went from India to the US to India back to the US. Like on a personal level, like what were those transitions like for you? Well, it's, it all, all has to do with family. All emotions have to do with family ties, right? So first you get married and I moved to uh, Houston. So you're saying goodbye to, to your family back in India. And then, you and then you're here, you go back to India, then all of a sudden you're reunited with your family. This is a great, great thing. But then again, you left all your friends back here in Houston. So that was, again, you know, you miss your friends, but you're with your family. And then coming back to uh, Portland, it's the same. You know, now, you, uh, you know, my part of your family is back there. Mm -hmm. So it was hard uh, for both Acha and myself because, you know, you're like, you're, you don't get to see your parents as often as you want to. There was a sacrifice in each step. I guess so. Yeah. But there's a sacrifice, but there's also a plus point and mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um what was it like to raise two kids in two different countries and two different continents in two completely different cultures? You mean when you were back in India? Yeah, because you had to raise me and my brother both in India and in the US, which is very different experiences on both sides. All right. Uh, raising you guys in India was, uh, to me, was not very difficult. The, the challenge was when we, we made that transition. So how, our, our worry was, how would you blend in with the new environment? How would you feel? Would you be comfortable? Would you be, would there be challenges? How do we overcome that? In school, you had to learn all these new languages to write and read, you know, a new set of friends. Even for you guys, you had to say goodbye to your friends back here 
and move. So how would all that work out? But, um, you know, somehow we were blessed because everything sort of worked out. You guys blend, uh, were able to blend in with your new environment without many issues or problems. We found that it sort of worked out uh, and all that stress and anxiety was not really needed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, there is a question I ask a lot of my friends who are mothers, um, and it came out of a conversation I had with um, an old mentor of mine, Carla. She officiated at my wedding. Um, so back when I was in college, I remember asking her like how motherhood had changed the way she saw God or understood faith. And for her, she said, well, after becoming a mother, she just couldn't understand why a God would allow their child. Like she just, she stopped believing in hell because she couldn't understand how a parent could ever subjugate their kid to that, um, which I thought is a very fascinating um, point. And so I really like asking um, my friends who are mothers that question. So I'm curious for you personally, has motherhood change the way you see and understand God and or faith? Yes. I can point that out specifically when I see other kids or other families going through trouble. And that's when I realize that we are really blessed, right? Recently, one of my friends lost her daughter and then when you think about all the war-torn war places where mothers are not able to support their children, they're in some sort of a camp, they cannot provide for their children, there's no education. That's when I think faith comes in. It teaches you that you're in a position where you've, you're taken care of and you need to nurture that faith within you and spread that with your kids. Um, so I think as a mother, being a mother, you start thinking about faith when you see where you are in that particular time or place. Mm -hmm. um, see that all those blessings, uh, that's when you really, really understand that you know, uh, faith has done so much for you. Has being an immigrant affected your faith and or your, how you see and understand God? Yes, of course. You know, uh, one thing was when you're in a different place, you associate yourself with uh, groups or faith groups or religious groups or some sort of a spiritual group, it's in a different setting. You're with different kinds of people. You are uh, exposed to different viewpoints. Uh, and it's different from how you grew up, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it gives you an opportunity to think and understand and, and look at faith in a different way. And um, I guess that's... Uh, it's important that uh, even if you're in a different setting, even if you're an immigrant, um, also holding on to your basic faith, your beliefs, and what you have been taught by your parents or you know from others is important. And of course, you know, moving to a different country, always sometimes you question faith. You know, you think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, eventually it is, it's all, it's all for the good. I owe you a lot um, in when it comes to how I grew up understanding faith and understanding God and religion, because you, um, well, you grew up in a Catholic family and married into um, an Eastern reformed um, denomination. Um, but I always called you Catholic-ish because you always had one foot in each of your experiences, but also you kind of saw the bigger picture in many ways. So I remember when I was little and I'd ask you questions, you'd always tell me that um, 
that there were so many different paths to God. And sometimes it looks very different. Sometimes um, people, the path looks like worshiping Allah. Sometimes it looks like worshiping Vishnu and the, like you, and sometimes it's worshiping Jesus. And like, I remember where you telling me that, and that was a very, um, I think that was a very important thing for me in my faith journey, because I approached everything with that openness and understanding um, that there is no one answer um, to experience God and to experience love in that sense. Um, do you remember that? Do you remember telling me that? Yeah, uh, it's funny because I still sort of believe in that, that statement because um, to me, praying doesn't happen in front of a, at an altar or, or your experience with God is not always the same. It could be when you're driving the car, when you're working, when you're cooking. For example, when you're cooking, you're like, oh, I get to cook something for somebody else. Or, you know, at the same time, I always think there are parents or mothers who do not have, who cannot put food on the table for their children. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that, and if you're able to uphold them in prayer, Mm -hmm. you know so that's different so you're you're praying while you're cooking you're experiencing all this while doing other things mm -hmm. well there are times when I don't like to cook that's a different story <laughs> <laughs> that's me every day <laughs> uh, uh, I am going to turn the table around and ask if see if you have any questions you'd like to ask me Okay. Uh, well, to me, mother means not necessarily a person who is a mother, not necessarily a person who uh, who has kids or who who plans to have kids or who's adopted kids. A mother who's is a person who's born on earth who can be a protective mother. Mm -hmm. right it could be a kid or you know it could be anybody who's so when you when we celebrate mother's day to me it's it's not just a mother mm -hmm. you're celebrating a motherhood or anybody yeah. is celebrating everybody who's potentially a mother so in that context where do you see yourself? That is an excellent question. <laughs> um, well, obviously I have two cats that I feel very, <laughs> very deep feelings for. So <laughs> I do consider myself a cat mom. Um, but other than that, where do I see my, like, where do I see myself mothering people or things? Um, I, I always have a tendency, especially with, um, people that I'm close to, people that I love, um, when they're hurting or if they're going through a tough time, like I think there's some part of me that wants to mother them into like just holding them and letting them know it's going to be okay, like you're not alone. And um, and I, I mean, I have to be. I'm pretty. I've I'm an enneagram type too, so I've learned to. I've learned that it sometimes can be bad, and I should be very careful in how I do it. But I always have that. I always sense that need in me of like, when I see people hurt and sad of wanting to just comfort them. Um, and I think that's something you both intentionally and unintentionally probably taught me when I was a kid. Let me ask you, so, um, has anything changed after you got married? Um, well, now you, also have Nitin's mother to mm -hmm. you know consider um what do you have to say about that and how is your relationship with Nitin's mom it's been hard to get getting to know her because we've been on different sides of the country um but it's also been so fascinating and such an honor to sort of hear um how she mothered my husband 
um, because a lot of who Nithin is and um, a lot of his values and how he wants to move through the world comes from his mom. And it's just, like I sort of like, like knew that in my head before we got married, but I think after getting married, I'm really seeing and experiencing it. So I'm, yes, yeah, so I'm just, she's such a strong and wonderful woman. I, I'm grateful to having her in my life. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because as uh, after you get married and you have an extended family or husband's family, you learn a lot from them. You know, I've learned a lot from uh, my mother-in-law, um, you know, how she, even though she was not working, she was a full-time mom at home. I admire how she ran the family and she worked continuously morning to night just making sure everybody was okay and you know provided for so uh, I like those values that she had and uh, it's you learn a lot you know, your you know your in-laws of course oh, I had another question I forgot to ask you earlier um <laughs> what are your thoughts about feminism well I feel strongly about that because uh, just like decolonization, right? It's an issue. And then we probably need to make people aware that, hey, we are equal to, to you or- Women are people too. <laughs> I meant, you know what I mean. No, I mean, I, I believe that. I think that you yeah. have to remind people that women are human beings and should be treated the same as like, yeah. whatever dignity a human being deserves. Yeah. I do feel strongly about that, but at the same time, I also feel like taking an example of like, say, Acha or my husband, you know, your dad, he, uh, he grew up in a, in, a, in a time when women work at home, work at, uh, go out to work in the job field and come back and do a lot of work. And that was normal, right? We did not, we were not aware of the fact that, hey, I'm doing too much. Are you, you know, you, you, you don't realize that. So, um, so I don't blame him in some things, in some actions of his, but, um, you know, I do think that everybody should be aware that, hey, mm -hmm. things need to change. I d was the conversation about feminism, whether or not they use the word, was it, were people talking about those kind of things when you're growing up? No. People talked about how you need to be, how as a mom, how as a woman, uh, what you need to be and what that brings to your family, mm -hmm. right? If you are able to wake up in the morning, do all the work make sure your kids are taken care of and then you go out to work you come back and at least in the environment we grew up in the women the woman of the house was sort of the backbone of the family mm -hmm. you know so uh, it seemed like the more you could do it all was for the good of the family mm -hmm. that was what we thought uh, was the best thing to do and that's what we all strived to do. And then later, as time progressed, we realized that, hey, maybe I don't need to do that much, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's not uh, a problem that, was, that came about or was brought about by the men folk. It was something that the women took up by themselves. Mm -hmm. And consciously or unconsciously I you know a mother would ask, raise a girl or her daughter to be like that remember I would tell you wake up in the morning you know that's what a girl should do don't yeah. wake up late in the morning I'm sorry for disappointing you on that <laughs> but I'm curious what was it like to raise a daughter who ended up becoming a feminist pretty young whether or not I called myself a feminist I was a little girl but I, I remember just growing up and being so like 
irrationally angry at the fact that I was expected to do more household work than my brother was just because as a woman, I was expected to um, learn how to make chicken curry, like, right, even, um, and I remember as a little girl being so frustrated that girls were meant to do things and didn't have the same freedom as like men did, like even like, oops, even um, in terms of going out and hanging out with my friends, especially when we were in India, like my brother had so much more freedom than I did. Um, part of it's like a safety thing, but also there is a huge difference in how um, society, especially our South Asian society um, treated, especially how our South Asian society said what the role of a girl and a woman in a society should be. Um, I just always, I've always hated it. I, I don't remember ever conforming as a child to any of those notions. Um, and yeah, so what, what was, what has, what is it like to raise a very um, angry little feminist? Well, uh, I was, it wasn't something that bothered me, uh, you know, I, you are very strong from the time, the get-go, you know, you were like, this is what I want to do and this is what I will do. And we were okay with that, you know. Um, but at the same time, like you said, it was all values that the society expected you to follow. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting because at that time, you know, nobody, at least I did not know that that's not the case, right? Or your grandma didn't know that's not the case or your aunts or your uncles or your friends didn't know that's not the case. And as you grow up, things change. Mm -hmm then everybody learns and hopefully embraces that, that thought that, hey, women are equal, you're not. But what I'm proud of is, um, you know, Omar or us, your brother and your husband, they both, uh, they both help out and- uh, They're feminist men. They're feminist men? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like I pointed out earlier, uh, it's, it's an example of, uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily, I'm not angry at that because down the road, your children are growing up or you know the next generation when they are growing up, they would look back and say something you did was wrong, mm. right? It's not because you think it's wrong and you're doing wrong it's because that's what that's that's what we know at this time yeah right so it's uh, over ages this will go on and on and on things would be right at one point in time it'll be different so there's different viewpoints as the time that changes what's something that you've learned from me from you, I think feminism. <laughs> yeah, I've I've learned that uh, you know you've you've actually made me more aware of that, and uh, yeah, I think that's that's one thing that I learned from you. So I don't feel at when you wake up late in the morning like I used to. <laughs> Yeah. yeah what what else what else um well i like how uh you know hold on <laughs> how long did I learn it you? takes you so long to figure that out <laughs> feminism is the only thing i've taught you but i i like um I like how uh, you know you have so many friends and how you keep up with them and how you are concerned about your friends and how you interact with them and uh, I really like that. I like how you write little notes to your friends and little cards um, and you know you have that emotional connection to all your friends and I think you've taken up after your father on that like keeping up with your friends and that's very very important. Yeah. Um, any last words you'd like to tell the people? You last can say no. 
Well, um, happy Mother's Day to everybody, right? And um, I wish everybody would take a moment, look back and at the real meaning of uh, Mother's Day and think about the mothers who are not in a in an equal position as you are and uh, maybe pray for them and hopefully places where there are war and uh, you know and place, places where a mother is not able to provide for your dear children and take care of them that's very hard so just keep those people in prayer and uh, enjoy mother's day as much as possible Awesome. Thanks, Amma, for being here and sharing a little bit about your life um, and how much you like me, your favorite child. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone, for tuning into this episode of Liberating Faith. Make sure you like, subscribe, and do all the things to this podcast. Um, and we'd like to know what your favorite part of this conversation is. Make sure you either send us a message on Instagram or email us at shelovespodcasting at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your thoughts about the podcast and all of that. Um, yeah, have a wonderful, um, wonderful day slash evening, wherever you are. Bye. Bye. Hope this episode inspired you to choose radical love. We hope these voices cultivated a curiosity that asks questions. Let us walk towards a new humanity together. We invite you to continue the conversation and join our online community of love, kindness, and accountability at She Loves Mag on Instagram. If you liked this episode, please subscribe and review our podcast on whichever platform you're listening from to help us spread the word about liberating faith. If you have any feedback or questions, please email shelovesmagazine at gmail.com. That's shelovesmagazine at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.